Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to this uh, press uh, conference organized by the International Union of Forest Research Organizations, IUFRO, in partnership with the permanent mission of Austria to the United Nations here in New York. Thank you for actually attending this conference this morning. Um, uh, the topic uh, of the conference is forest and water, and we are going to present to you the, the results of the most comprehensive scientific assessment uh, which has been carried out to date about the uh, linkage between forest and water at a global scale. My name is Alexander Buck. I'm the executive director of the International Union of Forest Research Organization. Our network connects around 600 member organizations, universities, research institutions in 125 countries around the globe, bringing together an estimated 15 to 20,000 scientists. And I'm delighted uh, that we have with us today uh, two uh, of the world's most renowned experts on the topic of forest and water, as well as the coordinator of the initiative which delivered this global study. Um, let me just give you a very uh, brief introduction. As I think we are all aware, all life on Earth needs water, making it one of the planet's most precious resources. Most of this water comes from forested watersheds. Yet, as the global population grows and as climate change exacerbates, um, there will be increasing droughts, there will be increasing shortfalls in water supply, making the uh, topic of the global study, which we're going to present to you, a very pertinent one. Therefore, we believe that it's really essential to understand uh, the linkages between climate, forests, water and people. And as I mentioned before, uh, we have just um, presented here to the High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development uh, the results of this most comprehensive study. And uh, I'm delighted to now introduce you to our experts uh, on the podium. First, we have Dr. Christoph Wildburger. Dr. Christoph Wildburger is the coordinator of the Global Frost Expert Panels, an initiative in the frame of which this assessment has been carried out. Next, we have Professor Irina Creed. She's the executive director and professor at the School of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Saskatchewan in Canada and one of the leading experts on the topic of forest and water. And uh, last, we do have Professor Dr. Meiner von Nordweig. Uh, he has for the past 25 years worked at the World Agroforestry Center based in Indonesia, lately as the chief scientific advisor. And likewise, he's one of the world's leading experts on the topic of frost and water. And together, Professor Creed and Professor von uh, Nordweig have co-chaired the scientific work of the expert panel, which delivered this global study. Colleagues, let me start by inviting Dr. Wildburger to provide the background, the rationale uh, about why this study has been commissioned and carried out in the first place. Dr. Wildburger, please. Thank you, Alexander, and good morning to everybody. Uh, IUFRO does not only uh, work in science collaboration, but also works at the science policy interface. And in that regard, we are leading the Global Forest Expert Panels, this initiative carried out the study we are presenting today. And the Global Forest Expert Panels, they, their mission is to uh, provide scientific knowledge to the policy processes in which the decision making is taken on forests and forest related matters. We do that by establishing thematic panels on forest related issues of high concern. These panels do assess the scientific available information on the topic and we produce scientific reports and policy briefs on the subject matter and provide these uh, materials to the, the policy processes and the stakeholders in the policy processes. Um, by doing so, we manage to impact on the decision making. We are uh, recognized in several decisions of multilateral and environmental agreements. We are used in, uh, uh, as guidance or the outcomes are used in, as, as guidance for uh, policy development, as briefing documents for negotiators, for example, in the climate uh, context for the Red Plus negotiators. And um, the materials are also used uh, for teaching purposes for the scientific community. So why did we take up the uh, topic of forest and water? First of all, um, of course, water is the most elementary ecosystem service on Earth, and uh, it's the basis for all life on Earth. And uh, while the uh, 
population of the Earth grows, the demand for water rises, of course. And uh, at the same time, uh, forests and trees influence uh, the water resources at uh, multiple levels, at multiple scales, actually in multiple ways. And yet so far, uh, this nexus has not been taken up by decision makers and has not been um, inf influenced decision making. At the same time, we have to recognize that our climate is uh, changing. So we have uh, a more um, a less secure climate. We, we face um, a, a more volatile climate and we, we need more buffering for that. And uh, forests can provide these buffering functions to avoid uh, droughts and floods. <clears throat> and this creates now the challenge that uh, we have a rising demand for water. Uh, we do have um, uh, a rising demand for buffering function, but we do not have um, uh, a rise in forests. On the, on the contrary, uh, in, in some parts of the world, uh, the forest cover is decreasing. So uh, now, um, in this discussion we've, we have now, at the moment, in the UN, on the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, I think it's the right point in time to, to uh, include uh, this nexus of forest and water in the decision making and especially also the nexus of forest and water to climate and people. And our study uh, wants to contribute now to the discussion on the implementation of SDGs and to the understanding of the nexus between uh, climate, forest, water and people and also on the trade-offs uh, and synergies that are um, inherent. Thank you. this uh, piece of um, uh, research or the scientific report. Uh, Professor von Nordweig, could I then ask you to elaborate a bit on you know, uh, the questions that have guided the work of this assessment and perhaps also provide a bit of background about the size of the panel, the, the experts involved, and so on? Thank you. Yes, <coughs> um, it, it has been a remarkable journey over the past year or year and a half, and um, this expert panel consisted of in the end, about 50 scientists working in, in about 20 different countries, parts of the world, and together reviewing over 1,000 recent scientific publications. So um, what, we, what we try to do is pull out of that the most salient, the most relevant parts for the current discussion on sustainable development goals. At the same time, we, we, we really had to start with what are the key questions? Um, because it seemed obvious to most people that forest and water are closely related. And of course, uh, a quick map on the world suggests that where there is forest, there is plenty of water. And where there is no forest, people have problems with water, water deficiency and water quality. So purely from the geographic pattern, it seems clear that forests are related with water. At the same time, at the policy level, um, it is not clear at all. We have a Sustainable Development Goal 6 that is about water and is mostly about getting, giving access to water of the right quality to all the people in the world without much consideration of where that water would come from. We have Sustainable Development Goal 15 that protect, talks about protecting the forest for the services and we have a Climate Goal 13 and at the same time... Um, the connections between those three are relatively weak in the current formulation of SDGs, and, and we, we really try to position our report on that interface, on that nexus. So uh, <coughs> after various steps, we, we came up with the three overarching questions for our report, and that is, first of all, do forests matter? Does it help to have more trees? Tree planting is a very common uh, response to issues on climate and concern and often expressing political commitment. But does it really help to have more trees for the issues of water that we have r right now? Or are trees using more water than other vegetation like we've seen in the eucalyptus debate and, and we might rather have less trees if we want more water? Well, we found that that question itself, um, yeah, it, it captures a lot of the debate over the last 20 years about how to reconcile the 
impact that trees have on using more water with the ideas that that water that trees use is not lost but is going back to the atmosphere and might come back elsewhere as, as precipitation and rainfall. So within that do forest matter question, there's a lot of, of debate of the past 20 years is captured within that. The second question is who is responsible, who is in charge, what is the social dimension of it. And of course, uh, forests have mostly been managed by state or state-level institutions, uh, forestry departments, but are they fit, are they at the right position to actually start managing water in a more direct way? So we have questions at that scale, and then how does it link to people on the ground, how does it link to farmers and the trees that they have, and how do we see governance of water associated with governance of forest? And the third question is then, um, if we see all this, how can progress be made and be measured within this interface? And, and is the current set of metrics that we have in the 169 targets of the SDGs, are we actually capturing the essential part of the nexus, yes or no? So in, in doing that, we then realize that they're underpinning all these things are three basic perceptions of how we see forest and water. And um, the most common widespread perception is still what we now call the paradise lost, is the no forest, no water slogans, um, leading to expectations that more forest would mean more water. Well, that has been largely discredited by hydrological science of the past 20 years, but it still has some important elements and important relevance. It got replaced by the more forest, less water perception of competition, yeah, and there's a finite amount of water and either trees use it or crops and, and it's, it's a choice where, where the water goes. And now the recent one is rediscovering the cycle, rediscovering that atmospheric connection between what happens in one piece of land and what happens elsewhere. And in the report, we, we yeah, describe these three as, as evolving paradigms. And we do think that in that last one, um, we don't have generalizations. We don't say all forests do this all, with all water. It matters much more where we are on the globe. But half the rainfall overland is probably re related to recycling elsewhere. So we have the not only the upstream-downstream, but also the upwind-downwind relationship. And that's um, where we had a lot of the specific questions coming down to. And, and I think that's where the nexus of the SDG 6, 13 and 15 plays out in a much more specific locational context. Um, I'd like to hand over to my co-chair for going through the, the conclusions we came up with. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor from Nordwijk. Uh, much appreciated. So now what we are going to hear are really the findings, the main findings and conclusions of the report. And, uh, you know, following the example of previous similar assessment reports uh, coordinated by UFRO, we do have the full report and the policy brief. So here they are, fresh from the press, fresh for the media. Mm -hmm. And now, Professor Creed, could I ask you to uh, elaborate on the key findings of the report and the key conclusions that we also uh, want to bring to the attention of the decision makers, makers here in this important high-level political forum? Thank you, Alexander. So... The main finding is water security is central to all 17 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We can recognize that. And to answer the question, do forests matter? The answer is an emphatic yes. Forests matter for water security. But this relatively simple answer hides a much more complex reality. Because it's not just that forests matter, you need to have the right tree, the right age, at the right time and the right place. And that's where science needs to advance even further to help policymakers understand how we can better use forests to provide that water security. Our main findings can be summarized, although there are 10 of them, I'm gonna summarize them in three key points. Overall, we need to manage forests better for water security. To do so, we need to rethink about how we perceive forests as sources of water. For centuries, we know 
that forests provide high quality and often regulate water flows downstream to the benefit of many people who live downstream. What a spotlight of this report shows is that it also has an impact on people downwind. And so that is a very different way of thinking about forests that benefit people both downwind as well as downstream. And it will demand that we look at new ways of managing forests in order to consider both aspects of that source of water. The other thing is, is that we need to reposition the forest water relations in international policy discussions. Many of us are aware of forests being central to carbon, but forests are not just about carbon, they're also about water, and we need to bring that conversation into the international policy uh, discussions, but also at national and regional and local scales. Finally, we need to reimagine some of the interventions. We need to consider new institutional and governance frameworks that will allow us to take this systems approach to break down the barriers of individual uh, SDGs. We have climate, we have terrestrial systems, we have freshwater systems, but we now recognize that they're all one coupled system. And in order to be able to manage that coupled system, we need to think outside of those boxes defined by the SDG goals. And we also need to create policies that uh, allow both state and non-state actors to come together in a participatory way so that we ensure that we have both social and environmental justice and equity at the end of the day. Thank you, Alexander. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Professor Creed. So it strikes me that you know these are very relevant findings, but what you mentioned about the downwind role of forests in actually really influencing where rainfall actually falls in rather distant locations is a rather novel aspect of this whole piece of research. So thank you for that. I would now like to invite uh, questions from the media, if there are any. Once more, this is the report, and we shall be pleased to share that with you later on. Um, any questions in the room? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, thank you, professors, for the, for the briefing. Uh, I have just a small question. Uh, the press release says a, a global water uh, crisis is looming on the horizon. Can you please give me some uh, figures to show this is a serious crisis? And also, can you summarize the solution, solutions to this crisis? Okay, thank you. Yeah, let me give a start, and then Arina can, can follow up. Well, um, the, the number of people for whom there isn't enough water every day of the year is, is estimated to be 4 billion people. So that's more than half the, the global populations. And um, within that, there are people who, who have water most of the time but are still sensitive to floods or droughts. There are people who really don't have enough quality of water. Now, um, the interesting part there is is looking at the geography of that. Where are these people living? And by and large, they are living, of course, in, in areas with low rainfall and low forest and tree cover. But this connection with the, the downwind gives us some new insights of it. For example, um, the relation in the Amazon between the Amazon forest and rainfall in the drier parts of Argentina is now pretty well understood and covered. But the science points to very similar relations in Africa that have not yet been as clearly recognized. The Nile Basin feeds all the people of, of Sudan and, and Egypt, and yet um, most of that water comes through the Blue Nile, and almost all the rainfall in the Blue Nile Basin is recycled from the Congo Basin in Central Africa and East Africa water water coming in from the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, and then um, falling as rainfall in that part of Africa, coming back to the atmosphere, uh, and then becoming the rainfall in, in the Nile Basin. Well, um, there's a huge risk that with what's currently happening with forest cover in the Congo Basin, that that source of the rainfall is, is at risk, and that 
the number of people that depend on rivers like, like the Nile and are dependent on forests elsewhere on the same continent. That is way beyond the current climate change discourse, and yet it, it, it shows up in the spatial data that are about how moisture moves and, and things on that front. And that's why we realize that there, at the moment we don't have an institutional platform to, to even start to discuss these relations. Uh, we have the, the basin management, the Nile as a basin, but the way it depends itself on, on forests elsewhere in Africa ha has not been picked up. And, and so in that sense, we say that um, yeah, people who currently depend on rivers may take for granted that these rivers will flow <laughs> and that the rainfall that drives them will flow, but we now start to realize that forests do play a role in that causation of rainfall at the same time, that patterns of change, not only the global warming, the global climate change, but also the more regional patterns of land cover change will affect them. There's also relations in, in China. Ch uh, rainfall in China is quite dependent on recycling in, from Southeast Asia. And so we, we do think the current um, vulnerability of people to water is, is an underestimate <laughs> because we don't take those relations into account. And at the same time, um, yeah, and at the moment, water, on average, a drop of water coming in from the ocean might fall 2.7 times as rainfall. Um, there's no reason why it is 2.7. It could, could become 2 if we have less recycling. It, it might possibly become 3.5. And, and that changes the whole equation on, on water security and water shortages. So we, we do feel that there is a big gap in that type of understanding versus the current framing of climate change and climate agreements. And we think there's a lot of opportunity to, what we say, re-anchor that climate change forest debate in water in ways that have not been imagined so far. Maybe, Arina, you want to add to that? Thank you, Maini. Um, just to amplify some of the comments that Maini has made, with climate change, our water security is becoming increasingly unpredictable and uncertain. And we can have, in some places, too much water, and other places, too little water. And nobody's protected, both people in wealthy countries and developed countries, as well as poor people in developing countries, are all going to be impacted with this. If I just look at one case in Canada, in Canada, when we get the floods that happen, it's a billion dollar insurance fiasco. So many people are impacted, it's, it's affecting the economy, and uh, we need to do something about that. The role of forests can help mitigate some of that uh, extremes in the water, whether it's too much or too, too little, by being a sponge for some of the water, but also helping to regulate some of the flows downstream. But in, if we were to look at it on a global basis, you asked about the aspect of a global crisis. Everyone is impacted by it. But there are some places on the planet that will be more impacted. And the continents of uh, Africa come to mind in particular because the water security is also linked to both energy and food security. And we have to look at the nexus of all three of them. And if you look at all projections for India as well as for Africa, that is where the greatest growth in population will occur. And that is also where the greatest crises are anticipated in terms of water, food, and energy. Yes. I just wanted to add one aspect for the political level. Um, a part of the solution is also that we need uh, a coherent policy in implementing the SDGs. As we heard, I mean, all the, the water issue is connected to all the implementation of all SDGs. And I think the countries have to be aware, the governments, that they need to take uh, that into account in implementing the SDGs. So they have to take into account the trade-offs and synergies. So if you implement one SDG without taking a look into the other SDGs, you might impact the water resources negatively, for example. And you don't might not even intend to do so, but you have not taken into account the, the nexus. Thank you very much for this uh, important uh, addition and for, for these explanations. Of course, I mean, there's a lot more evidence in the report itself. So we also want to encourage you to really also use it as a source, um, uh, you know, further cases, further, further evidence and so on. Um, I'm asking, are, are there any additional questions in the room?
that does not seem to be the case. So therefore, I want to sincerely thank you for the for attending the conference, for excellent questions. I want to thank the panel for for their statements and for their explanations. And I declare the press conference closed. Thank you.